right. Good morning. It is February 24th, and this is the Senate Health and Welfare Committee. This morning, we're going to be looking at um, two bills. We'll be looking at S24, the flavored flavors bill, as we call it. And then later on, we'll be looking at the uh, flexibility bill with audio only. So this morning, we're, we're going to begin um, with our Commissioner of Health, Dr. Mark Levine, and Commissioner, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your day uh, to be here with us and to testify on S24. And, thank you. Uh, you can introduce yourself for the record, and uh, it, I think you know members of the committee. So we'll, we'll just go from there. Thank you. Sure. So... Um... This is Commissioner Mark Levine, Department of Health. And uh, this committee and I have a long history. Uh, <laughs> and an equally long and successful history with um, tobacco containing products and our youth, particularly. I don't need to recount <clears throat> past successful endeavors we've uh, embraced and the alignment that the committee's had with uh, much that goes on in public health. Many of my comments will be pretty familiar to you, um, having seen some aspects of the bill already that uh, you've been drafting. And um, sometimes they will have been considered by you already. Uh, others may be more novel. But what I'll discuss in the next few minutes will be um, nicotine, but minimally, because I think we're on the same page with nicotine. Um, Vermont usage patterns of these tobacco and vaping products. The um, other harms that flavors can have. The strategies used by the tobacco industry issues surrounding menthol in particular, and uh, its link to racial injustice, Vermont programming on flavors, and what has been done and not done at the federal level or uh, by other states. <clears throat> so everybody knows that nicotine is a major ingredient in nearly all of the flavored tobacco and e-cigarette products. We've talked in the past about how an important substance it is with regards to addictive nature, especially in developing adolescent brains, the toxicity it can have, the impact on brain development, specifically cognition, memory, attention, learning, and behaviors. The FDA acknowledges the association between first use of a flavored tobacco product and current tobacco product use and how this poses a potential public health risk. If you do studies of which multiple have been done, uh, surveying youth and young adults, they will cite flavors as a major reason for their use of the e-cigarette products, as well as things like hookah, cigars, menthol cigarettes, smokeless tobacco. Everyone here has probably heard of PACE, since we're all here in Vermont, but just to review, that's the policy and communication evaluation is what the acronym stands for. What it really does is it explores youth substance use behaviors. It's going through this year, starting uh, a year or two ago, and really tries to understand the impact of state tobacco and other policies, as well as public health communication campaigns on youth behavior. If we look at waves one through three in 2019, and looking at youth and young adults 12 to 25 years of age, 27% of past 30-day smokers used menthol or mint-flavored cigarettes, and 56% of 
of 30 day, past 30 day vapors used menthol or mint um, electronic vaping products. 10% of Vermont high school youth who vape reported that the primary reason that they used e-cigarette products is because they're available in many flavors. That data comes from our youth risk behavior survey. If we look at middle school youth, one in seven primarily use them because they are available in many flavors. From the 2018 tobacco retail audit, we know that flavors are accessible to youth in Vermont. 86% of tobacco retailers sold at least one kind of flavored tobacco product in 2018. And 40% of stores sold flavored e-cigarettes. 75% offered flavored cigarillos or cigars. Um, I think for my next set of comments, I'll talk a little bit about um, flavors in general. I think when we think about flavors, we don't always think about organic chemistry class, but flavors are chemicals. And chemicals, as we know, depending on what they are and how much uh, we use of them can cause bodily harm in some way. We have a campaign called Unhyped, which is a vaping prevention campaign for youth. It educates them and young adults on the dangers posed by flavors. Some of the things we talk about are the toxicity to cells from vanilla type flavoring in the vapes, other risks in e-liquid flavors, including cinnamon, strawberry, almond, and caramel. The California Department of Public Health issued a report on inhaled food flavorings in e-cigarettes and cited concerns about inflammatory response from chemicals such as diketones. Stanford researchers have studied how e-cigarette flavorings damage human blood vessel cells even without nicotine being present. And their, their findings included cinnamon and menthol flavors being particularly harmful. It, does, it goes without saying that flavors are there for a reason. And one of the more nefarious reasons uh, is to attract and retain customers of these products. And it's well known that uh, whether it's an e-cigarette, whether it's uh, a regular combustible cigarette, whether it's pipe tobacco, a little cigar, this is a strategy uh, used by industry to not only attract, but retain users of these products. And clearly menthol, is among thousands of flavors available, but it's well known to make quitting more difficult among youth, adults, and people of color. So I'd like to spend a little time on menthol since I know this is a big focus of your legislation and there's good reason for it. Um, looking just at CDC guidance and, uh, and programming and research. Uh, there's been a fair, fairly long history of menthol being marketed as uh, healthier, being advertised more prominently in low-income neighborhoods, in Black communities, tailored in brands specific for youth and adults. It's made up 36% of all cigarette sales in 2018. It has a significant link to what I would term the overall rubric and concept of racial injustice. A 2019 meta-analysis found that among black Americans, menthol smokers have 12% lower odds of smoking cessation compared to non-menthol smokers. I believe many of you may have seen Dr. Phil Gardner when he was here, or at least read some of what he's written. 
He testified uh, he, in our committee last week. Yes. Yes. Well, yeah. well yeah. very recently <laughs> you heard him. <laughs> he did. And clearly, uh, if you heard what he said, uh, being an expert on menthol use in black communities and its impacts, he feels that restricting menthol and other flavors is a true health equity issue and feels that in respect to flavor restrictions, if menthol is not included, uh, it's, it's racist. The tobacco industry does have a long history of targeting African-Americans with menthol cigarette advertising. The Truth Initiative has documented this in a document called Read Between the Lies. Black youth are specifically at risk due to targeted promotions and price discounting. More than 90% of Blacks who smoke report using menthol cigarettes. As a result, Black Americans have higher death rates from tobacco-related causes, are more likely to be exposed to secondhand smoke, and statistically, more than 39,000 Black Americans die from tobacco-related cancers each year. Very recent from our, uh, I think he still has a job, but I'll call him current or most recent Surgeon General, Jerome, a Jerome Adams. He put out the report in 2020 on smoking cessation from the Surgeon General's office and that specifically addresses the lower likelihood of smoking cessation among African-American menthol smokers. And he, it concludes, quote, use of menthol cigarettes has been shown to contribute to tobacco cessation related disparities in the United States, end quote. What have we been doing in Vermont? Well, our, as you all know, we have a tobacco control program, and for the last six years, it's been educating on the dangers posed by flavored tobacco products through a campaign called the Counterbalance Campaign. This communicates with parents and concerned adults about the availability and advertising of tobacco products with enticing flavors and a variety of e-cigarette devices, including disposables. More than 30 tobacco prevention grantees and OVX youth advisors have been engaging youth in educating on the harms of flavors. Counterbalance seems to have had a pretty significant and positive effect on youth perceptions and thinking. A youth from Danville uh, expresses the same concern that I have, and I'll just quote from this youth, I'm more concerned about flavored tobacco products because tobacco is one of the most harmful items. It can cause lung cancer, which kills many people each year, end quote. If we look at the uh, State of Lung Cancer Report 2020, produced by the American Lung Association, if we look at Vermont's rate of new lung cancers, it has not decreased in the past five years. What's been done at the federal level and other states? Well, in 2020, we know that the FDA did remove some flavored e-cigarettes from sale. They specifically did not remove menthol and mint. After this removal of the other flavors, sales of menthol and mint flavored e-cigarettes increased 105%. Needless to say, this did not really result in the desired impact in protecting our youth. A study, tobacco control is what it's called, highlights the failings of partial flavor restrictions to protect young people from the risks of e-cigarettes and highlights the concern of how youth and adults switch flavors based on product availability. The partial restriction enacted by FDA led to an increase of 1,000% in the use of disposed e-cigarettes, 
going from 2.4% to 26.5% among high school current e-cigarette users and a 4% increase from 3% to 15%, 400% increase among middle school. CDC documented these findings in a 9-18-2020 morbidity, morbidity and mortality weekly report and it cites menthol e-cigarette use among nearly one half of flavored pre-filled pod or cartridge users and one quarter of flavored disposable product users. Obviously this report refers to the advantage of comprehensive implementation of evidence-based strategies at all levels, national, state, local, to prevent and reduce youth tobacco product use which ideally would be done in coordination uh, with comprehensive FDA regulation. But um, as you know, we've been waiting some time for this and have not seen it. And what we did see was only partial. What have other states done? I'm aware that Massachusetts and California have passed comprehensive menthol flavor restrictions. Around the country, 125 local jurisdictions have done so as well. There are some states in New England that are at least actively deliberating on this issue and addressing flavor tobacco restrictions as a health equity issue, but I'm not aware of any legislation to this time, specifically in Maine and Connecticut. But it would be fair to say, you know, in a conclusion that restricting the sale of menthol and flavored tobacco products is a recognized strategy to reduce both the initiation in youth of tobacco use and the continuation or retention by the marketplace of youth use of tobacco and as a way to address health equity, which of course is in sync with the state health improvement plan, which has its foundational principles on health equity. And it's obvious looking at statistics that we can always do more to prevent tobacco associated cancers, heart disease, strokes, and all the tobacco related disparities we see in Vermont. A few other issues I'll just raise, uh, just uh, to not just to pike curiosity, but to uh, put them on the table because you need to hear the complete picture. Um, Every time in public health, we talk about something that's really good for people, there are not always 100% uh, of the public in the fan category. I refer to this as uh, concerns about the nanny state. Um, now we have successfully navigated the nanny state in Vermont previously, as you know, we had wonderful tobacco and vaping legislation last year and or a little bit more than last year and over the last several years. Um, and I think people recognize the importance it was to protect our youth from the kinds of outcomes they might have without these legislations. But nonetheless, um, one can only tell people so much what they can and can't do. So one has to choose wisely in those endeavors because uh, a complete nanny state would never be endorsed by anyone. Um, there's another issue um, that uh, always comes up in Vermont, which of course is cross-border issues. Uh, if you ban something in one state, but the state's pretty small and it has many other places on its borders, how do you uh, address the fact that you may not have impacted behavior much at all because people have access to what you've banned? Um, and I'm not aware of um, some of the states on, on our borders even contemplating this kind of legislation. Um, there's also an issue, I'll call it consistency across substances. Um, we all know what has happened in Vermont with regard to uh, the use of cannabis and the opportunity for people to do recreational cannabis. But there is also flavor considerations when you come to the edible forms uh, of cannabis containing products that um, could have an equal impact on youth brains. 
Um, and is it wise or, you know, is it inconsistent to do it on one substance and not another? I won't even go into alcohol, which has plenty of other flavors uh, and which has not ever been a problem that's gone away in Vermont. Um, will there be national policy, whether that be the FDA, uh, who's a little preoccupied now, like all of us, uh, with other issues, uh, we have a new administration. We have new players and many of these agencies that have to do with health. Uh, so will there be something on a more national level that would um, help the states because it wouldn't have to be this random process. And then finally, we should always think about healthcare reform, we should always think about population health being a major component or building block of our all payer model and uh, the benefits this could have in that arena, uh, because uh, with my last conclusion comment I made previously, we still have to worry about tobacco-related cancer, tobacco-related heart disease, tobacco-related stroke, you name it. Uh, those are all big issues uh, that require not just what you're entertaining, but you know, huge lifts um, in our society, uh, in the public health realm and uh, the impact of uh, a, a package of those on population health would obviously do a lot to advance healthcare reform in Vermont, as well as to make sure that uh, we are keeping our eyes on all of the balls um, and trying to not just reduce costs by somehow making healthcare cheaper, but reduce costs because people won't need to access the same health care because they're coming to it in a healthier place. So I will stop there. Thank you. Um, you gave us a flavor for a lot of different areas and we appreciate it. Um, I have two questions and then we'll, we're, we'll just take a couple of questions uh, and then move on because we have a, a lot of folks waiting to testify. Um, my first question is um, some, uh, well, I'll, I'll ask them in reverse order. We've heard um, that during the pandemic and as kids have been uh, isolated at home, we've seen an increase in youth use of these products. And do you have, is that part of the youth risk behavior survey or do we have that, um, does Department of Health have that data? Yeah, we, we are not going to have that data for some time, unfortunately. Okay. Um, and the pandemic has thrown a lot of this off sync, off sync if you will. So, yeah, cycle. sure. But, but you can rest assured that um, all layers of our society have been doing things while they're in a stay home posture uh, at increased levels that um, could be harmful to them. Yes, thank you. Then the other question I have is that I consistently hear from those who market um, vaping products, e-cigarette products that, oh, they are, these are so much safer than tobacco products. Um, and from your comments on flavors, I, I guess I automatically question that assertion, but maybe you could help us understand it. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've never been a proponent that these are safer in some way. Um, and the main culprit is the one I spent the least bit of time on today, but started out with, which is nicotine. Yeah. Um, so again, they are nicotine delivery devices. And I don't care if it's a combustible cigarette or if it's an electronic vaping device or what have you. If you're delivering nicotine and you have the ability to deliver nicotine in an even more concentrated pattern, uh, that is not good for the developing brain, period. Uh, so I would, I would stand on that uh, alone. Not to mention, I mentioned flavors and the chemicals and flavors, but there are lots, lots of chemicals in the devices in the delivery systems as well. So I think overall, um, I, I'm not sure the thesis that it's safer would, would really play out as well. Maybe safer in terms of lung cancer, but I'd rather you know, not try to equate 
lung cancer 30 years later versus a brain that's being impacted in the teenage years and then what's the potential in life for that person based on the fact that their brain has already been impacted. Thank you. Um, Senator Terenzini has a question and then Senator Hardy. Uh, thank you, Senator Lyons. Good to Cummins see you, too. Dr. Levine. Um, I had a question, but I'm gonna, at this time, I'm, I'm gonna hold off on it. I wanna, I wanna articulate my question a little bit better before I ask it, so thank you. Senator Hardy and then Senator Cummings. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Dr. Levine, for being here with us during your busy schedule. Um, I wanted to ask you or pick apart a little bit more your comments about the quote unquote nanny state, which, by the way, I hope we can find a different term for that. That one rubs me the wrong way for a lot of reasons. But, <laughs> um, uh, you know, you said basically, I heard you say we have to sort of pick our battles, you know, in terms of what we focus on and in, in at the broader public health level. And we've seen you do that over and over again during the pandemic, um, uh, usually with really great results. So I'm wondering if we're talking about in the context of tobacco, about picking our battles, is this a battle? And I just want to get your clear answer on this. Is this a battle we should be picking, the, the flavors and specifically the menthol battle for both youth and adults? You make the clear argument for youth. I didn't hear you focus as much on adults. That was a sticking point for us last year when this bill came up. And so I'd just like to get your clear answer to that. Sure. So for the youth, it's the initiation issue. And for the adults and the youth, it's the retention issue and the inability to quit issue, uh, which are clearly correlated together. Um, the health equity issues are really, really important. I guess when you, you know, when I talk about the nanny states often equated or, or it's a dichotomy, the nanny state and the savvy state. So the savvy state, you know, is sort of picking its battles wisely and um, the public through education is endorsing behaviors and getting there eventually versus the nanny state where you kind of like, we're done waiting. You can't do this anymore, uh, period. Um, so it is very, very challenging. The, the reality is my comments about consistency, you know, you open up doors every time you, you go through one. And so if, if, if you're gonna go through door number one for flavors in this arena, uh, do you then open up all these other doors which then follow suit and then you feel like, or if you're in the public, you feel oppressed in a sense because of the fact that so many dictums have come down. Um, and is there a point where education alone can suffice and trying to influence behavior through education um, as opposed to making the um, the choice, the default choice, the healthy choice. So these are both principles of public health that we struggle with because we always want the default choice, the healthy choice to be the default choice. And if you can't buy flavors, well, you've taken care of that um, pretty easily. But on the other hand, could you continue with the kinds of educational campaigns we've already started with and get success that way, it will take longer, but will you have more people come along with you and be less resentful, be feeling like uh, they have some freedom of choice in their lives uh, that you haven't imposed upon them? This is really, really challenging. Um, and um, I, there's not a really good answer, to be honest. Um, you know, I think if, if we in public health make everything dependent on strict policies and, um, and guiding people's lives in ways that they don't have that freedom of choice, um, we will lose in the end too. So we have to be, we have to be wise and you know, make, make these choices in a, in a way that's informed and really uh, works in our advantage. My, my preference on this one, to be honest, is this should be an FDA thing that's national. We shouldn't have to go state by state 
uh, and sort of chip away at this, if you will. Um, and I don't know with this new administration or anything, you know, if that's going to be a game changer or not. You know, it's, we've seen so many things dramatically change just in the last month, uh, but they're not addressing, you know, real specific things like this at this point in time. And the FDA probably doesn't even have time to right now. Um, but the bottom line is that would be the preferred way. It would take care of the border state issues. It would take care of a lot of things. And it would send a clear message um, to the populations of color in this country that people actually care about them. And they've actually uh, been thoughtful about these issues in that context. Um, me, it's so easy for Vermont to stand out on all of these things and, and be the, you know, the, the, the pioneer and the leader and what have you. But it probably in the big picture, we really do need to have this on a federal level. Uh, Dr. Levine, uh, just because you've mentioned the, the importance of education, and obviously we've made huge progress with the tobacco settlement funds that we've had, and yes. so have been able to uh, educate people and saw a dramatic downturn in the use of the tobacco products. Uh, but recently we've seen an increase, an escalation. And, so, and my question is, does the health department have sufficient resources to do adequately cover all of the education and prevention programs necessary to uh, sort of push back on the increased use that we're seeing? Yeah, so I'm going to give a yes and no answer because <laughs> we, we can always do more with more, but at the same time, uh, even during the pandemic, none of this programming has been shut down by any means. It continues to proceed on. And you, you, uh, your committee uh, knows even better about the Substance Misuse and Prevention Council that uh, you helped create uh, and uh, worked with the governor very closely on. And that council, of course, now has the tobacco component uh, under its province. So we're paying attention to this uh, pretty continuously. Uh, and I think that's a very positive thing. Um, I would never say no to more money, but I wouldn't say that um, money for education is going to, you know, an essential need this moment that, you know, everything's been cut and we need something new because that's not true. Uh, we still have a lot going on. You're on mute. Yeah. Being a good citizen, Senator Cummings and then Senator Hooker. And we're only taking questions from uh, members of the committee. Dr. Levine, thank you. I think I was on this committee last year and part of the discussion with the larger Senate um, on the issues around this. And I think you put your finger on it. We talk about youth but we banned the sale of any tobacco vaping product of any sort to youth two years ago, maybe three years ago now. And I'm assuming we don't have the data on whether or not that worked. <laughs> I don't think it did, but um, that's, that's been a concern. We, you can't sell it to kids. Um, the counterweighting balance is we've got some seriously addicted people. Um, the, the example that came up are all the folks outside the AA meeting lighting up. We've got the dual addiction. And then there's a lot of talk about, well, kids will just move down you know, to whatever's left on the table. So we're gonna leave raw tobacco on the table. I just filled out my absentee ballot and was asked to vote on whether or not Montpelier should allow the retail sale of cannabis. Cannabis is on the table in large part because banning it didn't work. Um, and it's better to control it. And so with 
this bill has no real money or program to help the ladies I know who take out their oxygen tube, light up and then put the oxygen tube back in. Mm -hmm. You know, are, are, is this really making progress unless we have a real kind of cessation or, you know, are we gonna get into judging by my emails, um, which, I've been trying to answer. We're getting a lot of pushback on why am I going to have to continue to wear a mask and be limited if I'm a, and get a vaccination if I'm healthy. Um, it's that it's that give and take. I think we're struggling with. I have never smoked. I don't have a none of my kids smoke. I don't have a dog in this game. I just am trying to find the right way to go. Yeah, and you're you're illustrating the whack-a-mole game too, yeah. because the FDA restricted all these fruity flavors and things of that sort, and that the magnitude of the increase in ment and menthol was just phenomenal. So it probably didn't reduce users of these devices; it just shunted them to a different flavor of the device, which is unfortunate. Um, I know what you're coming from and, you know, coming from a pandemic where we've been pretty prescription, prescriptive uh, for the population. And as you point out, there are people who are like, why do you mean I have to wear a mask, you know, and that kind of thing. And we've been using emergency orders, um, makes it even more challenging if you then come out with more uh, orders to uh, tell the population what they can't or have to do. But at the same time, um, we can't forget about all these other public health problems just because we've been going through a pandemic. So I, I, know, I know what you're talking about. I wish I had more statistics to give you on the youth behaviors through the pandemic and through their time being much more remote in learning than any of us wanted them to be. Um, we can only presume nothing has gotten substantially better. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to comment on worse without statistics and without data. Um, and as you point out, there are ways for youth to obtain things, even if we wrote legislation that said, you can't buy it, you can't get it on the internet, what have you. I'm hoping that the increase in age to 21 did eliminate a lot because it used to be that 18 year olds could still supply early teenagers very nicely and were still in their sort of peer network, whereas 21 year olds, a little less so, uh, and a lot more disconnect between middle and high school youth. So, uh, so uh, Dr. Levine, I, I think we should move to Senator Hooker for one last question because time is moving along and uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but- um, No, and, no problem. And we are gonna hear for, from some young people um, who may comment on accessibility uh, for, the, for the kids good. below 21. Yeah, good, thank you. Senator Hooker. Thank you, Senator Lyons, and thank you, Dr. Levine. Um, this, I just wanted to bring to mind another aspect of this. We've talked about education, we've talked about banning, we haven't really talked about marketing, and I think that that really has a lot to do with the number of people who, the number of kids especially, who are um, attracted to these products. And, and I think, I mean, this is just to put this out there so that we can perhaps discuss this at a, a, another time. But I remember the Joe Camel debate and uh, what that did uh, for smoking smoking in youth um and then the other aspect of course is taxing the products for every penny on the taxes there's a direct correlation between that and the number of kids who don't start smoking so. yeah, and thanks for pointing that out that's been especially effective um the other part just to uh, recap the counterbalance campaign and other such efforts at least at the youth level, allow the youth to call out the marketing 
and refute what it's trying to do, or at least reveal what it's trying to do somewhat surreptitiously at times. So they are directly confronting that uh, and trying to influence their peers uh, as they do that, which is a, a particularly effective and healthy way to go about uh, this problem. Committee, other questions? Senator Terenzini, have you formulated your words? I'm, I must admit, Senator Lyons, my internet connection this morning has been tough. So I, I, I think that my question was addressed, but did, did any of my colleagues ask about flavored alcohol and how that correlates if we, you know, if we think about banning flavored tobaccos, is, is flavored alcohol on the horizon, you know, is that the next thing we tackle to try to, you know, the flavored vodkas and the wine coolers and things like that? When I, I guess my question... I see both sides of this bill. I really do. And I have kids and, you know, nothing is more important than the health of our youth. But I just asked myself, like, like Senator Cummings said, we, we didn't, we couldn't tackle the marijuana, um, you know, usage. So then we made it, you know, now it's okay to use and we're trying to regulate it. And then I think to myself, if we pass this and in next biennium, are we going to look at flavored vodkas and wine coolers and, and that stuff? So that's sort of my mindset, and I'd love to hear any feedback you have on that, Dr. Levine. Yeah, so uh, as Senator Lyons is well aware, um, I do take my testimony seriously, and I, I try to come prepared, and I try to present you with the data and the public health angle, but I also feel it's important for me to be provocative when, that's, uh, when, the, when, when the opportunity presents and just put things on the table that people need to think about. Not that I have an opinion or no opinion on every one of those things, but um, I think issues that people should be thinking. And, and you've just raised one that I became provocative with uh, during this presentation, whether it's alcohol, whether it's a cannabis edible product or what have you. Um, because again, um, we know uh, what human beings behavior is like. There's plenty of research into uh, behavior and challenges in changing behavior, challenges in um, how behavioral marketing uh, really becomes a big deal. Uh, the whole field of behavioral economics for that matter. And so I'm not gonna answer the question about you know, the flavored vodkas and wine coolers and what have you, except to say that they exist for a reason. And Many people in our society are responsible and can have enjoyment from those and no harm caused. Uh, but obviously what we're looking at today is there are pretty large swaths of our population that actually um, don't actually just enjoy and not be harmed, but could actually find that as a, an initiation pathway that they didn't plan on otherwise, or a um, retention pathway that uh, doesn't allow them to extricate themselves from a challenging situation. So I do think it needs to be considered across all aspects of uh, products and human behavior, um, and perhaps thinking more broadly than just the flavored tobacco and vaping products. Uh, thank you, and thanks for your comments. Um, the, uh, I guess the question that we're trying to get at now is the, the huge increase in the number of flavors and the, the marketing that's taking place and the attraction for youths that we've seen in our committee. And it's really difficult for any of us to regulate First Amendment rights in terms of advertising, but we can certainly look at the health outcomes and impacts for um, these products and knowing how addictive nicotine is. And then finally, I guess um, my concern when we raise the issue of flavors in alcohol or in cannabis is that those two um, products are regulated in a, high, in a completely different way from tobacco. Tobacco is out more or less on the free market and cannabis now is being even, even Senator Cummings voted about cannabis regulation the other day, and um, alcohol is sold only in, uh, you know, high test alcohol sold only in uh, state stores. So the, there are significant differences that arise when we try to equate those two. I think it sounds jazzy, but 
Um, I, 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 had, I couldn't resist commenting. I'm sorry, Commissioner. Not Any a other? problem. Okay, good. All right. Someday we'll sit down and have a cup of coffee over this. I think we all deserve that at some point. Um, again, thank you so much uh, for taking time out of your day and the, and the important work that you've been doing for us on the pandemic. We greatly appreciate your insight into both the pros and the cons of uh, working on this issue. It's, it's always a challenge. Uh, for us, we're interested in saving the $348 million a year expenditures that we see on tobacco uh, healthcare costs. And we're very interested in improving health outcomes for our youth and our adults. So that's, that's the motivation. Um, and it is a public health um, issue as you have well pointed out. So thank you. Thank, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to uh, present this morning. Well, you've done it. Uh, you've done a great job as usual, and we greatly appreciate it. Good to see you all again. Yes, um, good. Thank you, and take care. Um, so we're going to turn to um, Aaron Segrist, who's here from the Vermont Retail and Grocers Association. Are you? There she is. How are you? Good morning. I'm well. How are you? Terrific. Good. So um, I, I think you prepared about five or ten minutes of testimony is that what we're looking at um, yeah hopefully less than 10 minutes i, oh. I don't want to take too much of your time <laughs> but well, and do we have something from you on our web page um i apologize i haven't sent it yet but i will send it as soon as i okay. am finished speaking yes terrific thank you and yeah. just send it to nelly it helps us then we can listen uh while you're speaking great uh, yeah so i think so, you know everyone on the committee um but I'll introduce Senator Hooker from Rutland County, yes. Senator Terenzini from Rutland County, Senator Cummings from Washington County, and Senator Hardy from Addison County. Hello. There you go. Thank you for having me today. Um, for the record, I am Erin Segrist, president of the Vermont Retail and Grocers Association. Uh, we represent over 400, sorry, 750 members across the state. Uh, our membership is inclusive of a variety of business types and models, including general retail, so like your clothing stores and your country stores, um, grocery stores, convenience stores, distributors, food producers, and also business service providers. Um, the retail industry in the state of Vermont employs over 65,000 Vermonters, and we collect about we collected about six and a half billion dollars in 2019 in state tax revenues. So I'm only speaking on the financial impacts of S24. Um, we do not have a position, or we have not touched on the health impacts or anything of like, again, just financial impacts. Um, so VRGA does not support the passage of S24, the bill that would ban flavored tobacco products and e-liquids due specifically to the financial impact this legislation would have on the retail landscape in Vermont, as well as on the state's revenues. A poll of my members returned a broad impact based on the size of retailer. Based on current sales, Small retailers reported that they would see anywhere from $35,000 to $45,000 of loss in revenue from these sales alone. Those on the Massachusetts border reported closer to $50,000 and $55,000 in loss, and a Vermont based convenience store with about 12 to 15 locations has reported that this would be a loss of more than $500,000. The Vermont-based convenience store that I just touched on reported that historically they give more than $250,000 a year to charities around Vermont. In 2020, while they were unable to match that amount, they continued to support cancer research and other community project projects by gifting just over $150,000. They also provide health benefits for their employees. Uh, last year, they incurred a 9.5% increase in premiums and they've seen double digit increases in premiums in 2020. As well, they've paid 
hazard pay on top of hourly wages well above minimum wage throughout the pandemic. So due to the pandemic, all stores, um, all store upgrades, they had had several upgrades to their various locations around the state. They have been put on hold since 2020. These have been multi-million, would have been multi-million dollar investments that would have been reinvested into the community um, and provided more jobs and benefits to Vermonters. So because of, should this bill pass, their concern is that those projects would be pushed off further and as well, they would be reconsidering um, additional benefits or a reduction in healthcare benefits provided to their employees due to this financial loss. Um, a local convenience and redemption center in Washington County reported to me last night that this ban would reduce revenues by $40,000 alone. And that does not include ancillary purchases that customers make while stopping in the store. He expects that if this ban goes through, he would be forced to reduce his staff. Currently, he has a 20 person staff and he anticipates that this, this ban would require a reduction by at least three employees. If products have been, so again, it's not really our place uh, to judge people with addiction. Uh, these products are approved and regulated by the FDA and consumers will have access to these products outside of Vermont. While customers want convenient access to these legal products, they will go the extra mile to get them should they be banned in Vermont. Further, consumers will make purchases of additional products outside of Vermont as well. Um, and it, we will no longer be talking about just the New Hampshire border impact, but we'll also be talking about the New York border impact as well as once the Vermont US border, or sorry, the Canada US border reopens, that will serve as a factor as well. Um, I do wanna share that I do feel it's a bit disingenuous to, to assume that by banning these products, people will quit. Um, recent reports on the financial impacts of Massachusetts recent ban shows that sales have surged in Vermont and New Hampshire. As Senator Cummings has touched on earlier today, as well as in recent hearings, um, prohibition of alcohol and cannabis has failed to keep these products out of the hands of, of underage consumers. And if these bans haven't worked any, in anything else, why are we thinking that banning flavored tobacco within the political borders of Vermont will do the same? I do wanna to touch quickly on tobacco compliance tests. Um, as you know, the Department of Liquor and Lottery each year conducts tobacco compliance tests. And in 2018, the overall percentage of these licensees who did not sell tobacco to minors, which means they passed their compliance checks, was 91.9%. .9%. In 2019, that compliance increased to 92.38%. Retailers do not want to be selling to underage consumers for various reasons. Specifically, morally, um, we did not oppose the ban or the increase in, in age from 18 to 21. But also financially, if retailers sell to an underage uh, consumer, they, they already suffer financial impacts. Um, retailers and the Department of Liquor and Lottery continue to work closely in improving trainings and access to those trainings to ensure that compliance continues. Additionally, uh, should to S24 pass out of committee, we do request um, the piece where, uh, the, what, what is it, S7 VSA subsection 1005, I believe it is. Um, we believe it should be should remain as written in statute. Aside from human error, tobacco compliance tests have shown that retailers are improving their compliance rates and past testimony has requested that this section be removed and stated that retailers were the reason for the epidemic we have in Vermont. Again, it's disingenuous to blame retailers for the underage access to tobacco products as well. We believe that eliminating the penalty for possession of tobacco products or paraphernalia is a, 
is the wrong de decision and further signals that there is knowledge that a ban on these products will not reduce usage. If the ultimate goal is to reduce smoking, those in possession of these products should be held responsible as well. Again, we oppose passage of S24 based on the financial impact to businesses, further reductions in workforce, and the fiscal impact to state revenues. Um, that's all I have prepared today. I'm happy to take questions. All right, thank you, Aaron. Uh, that was very comprehensive. So just to be clear, you think that the uh, penalties for possession should be left in statute? Yes. Okay, uh, and I, because I, I know there's also another bill that uh, the possession use and pur purchase possession and use and possession, which is also an economic development. So I don't know what you're thinking is on that, but we're not taking testimony on that in here. We have enough to do, yeah. but um, right. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And you will get us, well, you will get us your uh, written testimony. So we have- I'll it. send this as soon as, as soon as we're done. Yes. Okay, terrific. Senator Hardy. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Aaron, for your testimony. Um, I just have a question. Uh, I know that some of your members um, have voluntarily chosen to stop um, selling tobacco products in their stores, and they've done so um, for a number of reasons. But I'm wondering if your organization has done any work on um, the impact of those decisions within your membership and whether or not um, they have seen the benefits that I think they have wanted, which actually are increased sales in other areas, um, safer stores, um, uh, cleaner stores, and a lot of things that um, that um, come along with selling tobacco products. So I'm wondering if you've done any analysis um, or if you know how many of your members have voluntarily chosen to cease sale of these products. That's a good question. Um, I will share, we have, we have not surveyed our members about that. Um, but it, it is certainly a question to ask. Um, we have heard, especially since increasing the smoking age from 18 to 21, we've heard from several members that they have eliminated it because the, the break-ins or um, uh, the sa for safety reasons, right. they just decided it was best. Um, we, ha we have seen an, an increase in break-ins or um, you know, theft. So that's certainly something that we could poll our members on. Um, and, and certainly circle back with you once we have a, a response. Yeah, I think that would be interesting because I know that a number of retailers have, have chosen to do it um, for the safety reasons being number one, but for other reasons as well, moral reasons, ethical reasons. Um, right. And I think that financial impact may actually be less than, than you think because more people will wanna shop there because they feel it's a more kid-friendly place. Um, the other question I have, or just a comment, you know, you mentioned the increasing cost of healthcare um, insurance for a lot of your members. And, you know, we see that across every sector and this committee is extremely aware of that. I, I think, you know, one of the things that we've just heard testimony on from the commissioner and others is that over the long term, this will actually decrease health insurance costs because fewer people will be addicted to, to uh, tobacco. So I'm just hoping, I just, wanted to put that out there for you to consider in your analysis of the health insurance costs, because overall, if we have a healthier population, our health insurance costs will hopefully re be reduced. So just factor that in, in your analysis. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of the possession, um, you know, I understand that you don't want retailers to be on the hook for things. Obviously, that's your job. That's who you represent. Um, but you also said that you were sympathetic to people who are addicted to alcohol, uh, to tobacco. And I think one of the main things for the possession language um, is to not blame people for their um, addiction um, and not criminalize addiction. So I just hope that you can take that into consideration and in your comments about that section in the future. So thank you. Okay, I, uh, thank Senator, you. I think that some of this is gonna have to wait until we have committee discussion, but your points are well taken. Um, Senator Cummings had a question and then I think Senator Hooker may have had a question. Just wanted to clarify with Aaron, are you saying that when we banned the sale 
of anything to minors that there was an increase in break-ins or that the availability of tobacco in a store is, is in some way linked to break-ins? So I, I, I don't have exact data. Anecdotally, okay. we have seen that once the age limit was increased, more of our members were, were reporting uh, break-ins or thefts. I have, I have one member who called us literally a month after the increase and said, I've had three break-ins. One last night was, an, was the worst we've ever seen. I'm, I'm eliminating all of my tobacco. And, it, and it's break-ins to acquire tobacco. Yes. So I suppose logically you could extrapolate that if we banned it to everybody yeah, there may be, there's a black market. There may be seriously there's, addicted people. Um, there's absolutely a black market and, and we will, we anticipate and have seen in other states that when these bans happen, the, the black market has, um, has increased and, and we can anticipate or we expect that that will, will continue to increase if, should these products be banned. And these so-called trunk slammers are, are walking into actual retailers and saying, I can sell you these products for less if you would like to buy them from me. Okay, thank you. Senator Hooker, do you have a question? Okay, all right. Um, Aaron, thank you so much. Um, it's good to see you. And um, nice to see you. Thanks, thanks for coming in to testify. It's, it's always very helpful. Thank you for having me. All right, um, and I, I did actually want to clarify one thing. Not not for, it's not your testimony, but um, the question about what other states are doing. And uh, I do know that New York State has um, banned uh, e flavored e-cigarettes, so we're not completely without um, folks on the on around our borders who have done nothing. Okay. Um, so I think uh, I would like to move on. I'm going to move on to Richard Mar Marianas uh, first, and then I'm going to go to Graham Campbell because he has a he has a time limit. And um, so Richard, welcome. And uh, do we have testimony from you on our web page? Yes, I submitted testimony yesterday, and I appreciate your time. Uh, terrific. Okay. And so, again, we're looking for about uh, just a few minutes of testimony, and then we'll have a, a few minutes for um, questions. Yeah. So, because I like the interaction. Yourself for the record, and we'll look yeah. forward to your testimony. Great. For the record, my name is Richard Mariano. I'm a 27 year law enforcement veteran who retired from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms as the Assistant Director. Currently, I'm a professor at Georgetown University here in Washington, DC, and I'm a member of the International Association of Chiefs of Police and the Police Executive Research Forum. For all transparency, I'm also at various times employed by Reynolds American, the tobacco company, to do research and a look at their product being used for illegal and illicit means. Uh, I'm not a smoker, never had been a smoker, but I'm in opposition to Bill S-24. What I wanted to start out with uh, is a, a brief presentation on prohibition that has not worked and is currently not working as we've tried to prohibit flavors and increase taxes around the Eastern seaboard and around the United States. Right now, uh, a prohibition on a flavored product is a prohibition on an adult product that is very, very difficult because right now you can't go into a store as a young adult or somebody under 16 to buy something like this. So by putting a prohibition into this, we're going to uh, increase the amount of young adults we're gonna look for and try to find it. Second, it's a $13 million a year criminal market in Virginia, it, excuse me, Virginia, Vermont, I apologize, that if you ban this product, you, tend, you will tend to lose $13 million of revenue 
um, that's currently taking place right now. And that doesn't include what is happening in Massachusetts, where a large criminal population is now exploiting uh, the various states around it or coming to the various states to buy product or criminals coming in. Um, some of the things I wanted to talk about is uh, what, what, some of the, what it funds is prohibition and flavor bans fund criminal activity. Uh, it, it's known, it's a fact. I appreciate you asking questions of some of the panel members before, how it also destroys the quality of life in some neighborhoods. And um, it also creates a situation where if you put a ban in and a prohibition, it's very, very hard uh, for police, especially nowadays, where they're trying to do more with less, to have to now take on the position of the enforcement of the sale of a flavored product. I think in, uh, many of us will agree right now with the diminishing resources and what law enforcement has to take on, we want them to concentrate on serving and protecting um, rather than enforcing uh, some senseless bans. And, and why I say that is many will talk about a public health strategy and I want to talk, you know, concentrate also on a public safety strategy because my opinion and the, uh, the opinion of the law enforcement people I work with on anything, whether it's guns, narcotics, in order to have a healthy community, community, you need a safe community and public safety needs and must be part of your public health strategy. Um, there's been some questions raised about the illegal or flavored products, where are they coming from? I can tell you right now that currently Chinese organized crime um, is well invested in the products such as Jerry Berry and Captain Crunch and Skittles that appeal to the younger population that are being trafficked and brought into this country. So a prohibition is only going to slow it down and it's not going to put an end to it. Um, I give you some examples right now. There was just recently in the last three months, there's been 500,000 illegal vape products and vape liquids seized by law enforcement coming into the United States directly targeting youth um, from their marketing campaigns. And what I talk about marketing campaigns is how they package it and put it together. What I ask you is members of the committee, you did a great job in your analysis of the legalization of marijuana to try to root out crime. If we go to the flavor ban here, you're gonna create crime. And you're gonna create crime in areas such as organized crime, you're going to excuse me, organized crime, street thugs, terrorist organizations, people of that group that have been involved in this and are currently tra trafficking tobacco products along the eastern seaboard. And I want to give you an opportunity to ask questions, please. Uh, thank you. This is a, a, a different perspective and we appreciate it. Um, questions committee for uh, Richard. Uh, I, I have a quick question. When you worked for the ATF, uh, what was your um, area that you uh, focused on? I started as a special agent, organized crime, and I worked my way up, up to the assistant director where I was the number three uh, responsible for 4,800 employees. Excellent, thank you. All right, any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you I very think- much for your time. Yeah, well, no, thank you. We appreciate your being here and certainly you have the experience, that's why I asked the last question, um, the experience that lends itself to um, credible testimony and we, we appreciate it very much. Feel free to contact me if you have any other questions. My we information will. is available on my testimony and I'll be glad to help you or if we could do any research to assist you in this matter. Yeah, I think one of the one of the questions that you raise is something that under underlies a lot of the concerns and that is why we currently have a regulatory system for both alcohol and uh, cannabis in this state. It's a highly regulated industries. And the, so uh, 
if we're going to make that comparison, then perhaps we need to have a similarly regulated industry for tobacco. That's a whole different bill <laughs> and a whole different perspective. And I, I don't know how many uh, states are even considered something like that. Agreed. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, committee, and have a great afternoon. You too. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, Graham C Campbell is here. He does have a a fiscal note and he's on a schedule. So Graham, you you are now sharing screen and you could put that fiscal note up so we can see it. It's probably an opportune time after listening to Aaron Segrist. Sure. Um, can the committee see my see the fiscal note? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So um, my name is Graham Campbell. I work for the, the Joint Fiscal Office and um, for, uh, it's good to see some, some Senate finance people here and some former Senate finance people. I work with you a lot. Um, I work on mostly um, tax um, policy for the Joint Fiscal Office. And as such, um, taxation of cigarettes and tobacco sort of falls under my, um, my uh, policy area within the Joint Fiscal Office. Although I did work with um, Nolan Langweil on this um, fiscal note. But this is our um, official fiscal estimate for S24, which is an act relating to banning flavored tobacco products. And I will um, try to keep my testimony brief because I imagine there might be some questions. But largely, I would say for the committee members who were here last year, this is the sort of basic underlying assumptions um, that were in the fiscal note last year are pretty much the same as they uh, are this year. Um, I was not able to find significant literature that would change the assumptions in the underlying analysis. But what has changed is the revenue estimate for tobacco um, products um, in general, which have been revised about $8 million higher in fiscal year 22 than they were in the January 2020 forecast, which is what the previous estimate for um, a ban on flavored tobacco would be. And I, I want to highlight there that the, the increase was um, about four-ish million dollars on um, general cigarettes, and then another three million dollars. So the estimate for um, e-cigarettes was basically doubled from January 2020 to January 2021, and that's just based upon the actual tax data that we are seeing from the tax we collect on e-cigarettes. So. To get to the, the punchline here, table one shows the revenue impacts. In fiscal year 22, we think the total revenue impact will be about $5.64 million in revenue reductions across the general fund and education fund. The general fund will be from the, the, the taxes on tobacco um, and the education fund is the sales taxes on these products. Um, fiscal year 23, it jumps up to $6.69 million. That's primarily because in fiscal 22, the bill takes effect in September um, and so with a full fiscal year, so in the first fiscal year, you not only start later, but whenever you introduce a, a ban like this, the, the impact is always delayed by a month for any type of tax. So um, you see a sort of smaller number of fiscal 22, and then for fiscal 23, you're looking at the full impact. And then it declines down to $6.47 million, and that's basically mirroring the um, slow decline in cigarette um, and tobacco tax revenues that... Um, the consensus forecast shows um, over time. And so um, like last year, the majority of this um, revenue reduction is from menthol cigarettes. Um, I'm, trying, I'm just gonna quickly pull up my, my table here. So um, of the roughly $5.64 million in fiscal 22, about 3.9 of it is coming from just cigarettes. And so um, because you know, non, or, you know, flavored cigarettes are basically just means menthol cigarettes. That's essentially the impact of menthol cigarettes being banned in Vermont. Um, we estimate that about 18.8% um, of cigarette sales in Vermont were menthol cigarettes. That's lower than the national average. And that's, that largely mirrors the, um, the racial or the demographic makeup of Vermont. Um, African-American um, smokers tend to smoke menthols at a higher rate, um, but because our population we don't have as many African Americans in Vermont and some other states, um, that is that sort of shows up in our relatively low menthol cigarette usage rate compared to other states. Um, the I made the note here that these rest, revenue estimates are higher than they were in S two eighty eight last year, which is roughly the same bill, and that's because of the higher revenue estimates. 
um, that came out in the January 2021 forecast. Um, and I want to emphasize that within these estimates, there's quite a bit of uncertainty because the, the revenue loss here is directly tied to the extent to which people quit um, uh, using tobacco products altogether or moving straight into the, into the black market. Um, and so based upon surveys that we look at, um, depending on the type of tobacco, you're talking between 30 and 65% of all users would quit altogether. Um, and for youth tobacco users, the, the evidence was that about 60 to 75% would quit altogether or move into the black market. But I want to emphasize that even a, a relatively small change to these numbers, whatever the assumption is, can really change the revenue estimate. So for instance, if you make the, um, the assumption that Right now, I think we have about, we assume about 35% of uh, adults will quit smoking um, or join the, or leave the market altogether into the black market um, on cigarettes. If you assume that that quit rate jumps to 45%, you lose about an extra million dollars in revenue. So it doesn't take much here to make the revenue uh, estimates go up or down depending on those quit rates. So, you know, I'm sort of, I guess, covering myself in advance that if this bill were to um, receive it, um, resigned by the governor and the revenue estimates were much lower, much higher, it would be because of those quit rates. Um, and so the final point I want to add is, you know, the sort of long-term health impacts and the potential savings to Vermont are, you know, undeniable. Those are not something that we estimated in this fiscal note, and because, mainly because they're just, just difficult and they're somewhat indirect with lots of other factors being um, brought into play here. So um, I guess with that, I can um, take any questions on the note. Uh, thank you. Uh, that, that's very helpful and comprehensive as it was last year. I have two questions. Um, and, and you probably can take the fiscal note down because we have it on our, we also have it on our um, iPads. Um, so Graham, I, as, as we're looking at this, uh, you indicated that there's an increase in use uh, in 20, fiscal year 2022 uh, as compared with the past when previous um, analysis was done. So it, it's, and we've heard from folks that the pandemic has caused an increase in use of some of these products. Is there any prediction on your on your side of things that the use will drop after the pandemic? Um, on my end, I, I I'm not going to make that prediction. I'm looking at the <laughs> I'm looking at the revenue forecast. Yes, I know. Versions of the of cigarettes, tobacco products, and vaping products. Um, on the cigarette side, it looks like the consensus forecast is building a sort of one-time, what I call one-time bump up, but it's not as if the, the number is, you know, say in fiscal 20, it was a small number, it bumps up and then it goes back to that small number, it sort of goes up and then slowly comes back down again. Um, so there is that in the cigarette. What I would highlight here is in the vaping side, um, you know, one of the biggest fiscal misses I've made in my career has been on the, the vaping cigarettes estimates. Um, we estimated that was going to raise around a million dollars um, back when it was passed, and it's on track to raise about six million dollars um, in revenue, which is significantly higher than any other state in term after you adjust for population um, and usage. So there is something inherent to, um, I guess, Vermont vape usage that is putting its revenue collection much higher than what we saw in any other yeah. state, um, and so that is a number that received a big step up um, and it is not projected to come back down um, according to the consensus forecast. If anything, it's growing slightly um, from about $6.2 million in fiscal 21 to about 6.5 in fiscal year 23. So um, that is that explains a good chunk of the jump in, in cigarette and tobacco tax revenues um, that we've seen in fiscal year 22. Okay, thank you. My other question is probably one that would take um, a great deal more uh, investigation on your part in terms of the um, healthcare costs and the healthcare impacts, and, and maybe Nolan probably as well. Uh, the to reach out, for example, to those in the state who do cardiovascular surgery or care, where we've heard that 
pulmonary and cardiac uh, deaths have been increased or and treatment has been increased as a result of tobacco um, use. So, but so how much, if we were to ask you for an analysis of healthcare costs, how long would it take for us to get some sort of uh, preliminary or even more concrete data? Um, that's not something typically our office does overall as a <laughs> dynamic scoring. I can bring that back, that question back to Nolan. Um, and, and uh, yeah, it would be an interesting thought. You know, I, it's certainly not something we're going to ask for at right at this stage. We have heard from some of the advocates uh, specific numbers that have been sorted out from time to time, but it would be great to know uh, how that sugars off. Yeah, I can, I can follow up with Nolan on that to see if there's any. Yeah, you can look at some of the studies. I don't think we, we would, as our office, put together sort of offsetting numbers to this revenue impact. I mean, these the, any sort of revenue losses associated with cigarette and tobacco is always kind of a, um, a, a difficult thing, and such that if you lose a lot more money, then that means you're achieving your policy goal. Um, of, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, to the extent this number is actually less than someone might think it is, then you know, you could easily respond by saying, well, you know, then that means that not very many people are quitting smoking, which is not the old goal here. So, um, you know, again, uh, quite a lot of uncertainty in this estimate that this is based upon the literature what we, what we have available. And again, I would not write off those potential health benefits and indirect benefits um, and fiscal benefits, because um, I, I, Noel and I both agree that those are there, but that's just not the type of analysis that we often offset direct revenue impacts um, with, and, and it's not just in this um, in this setting. I mean, I, a good example is economic development. We almost never offset any fiscal cost related to an economic development expenditure or tax incentive right. with potential revenue benefits. So, just a sort of standard, not just our office, also, but also within the whole sort of um, fiscal scoring. Um, field with your state governments and the federally. Thank you. Uh, quick question for Graham committee. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank, for the, thank you for the update on this. And I know you've spent a lot of time uh, researching it initially and I, it, it, we appreciate it. And he has to go, we can see that. So, um, all right, uh, we're, We'll keep moving along. And we have with us um, Shane Lynn. I, I, I skipped over you. I do apologize for that. Um, but some of the folks we were listening to had uh, timing issues. And we appreciate your indulgence. So uh, why don't you uh, introduce yourself and give us your testimony? Super, thank you for uh, inviting me here today. I appreciate it. My name's Shane Lynn. I'm the executive director of Champlain Valley Dispensary, medical marijuana dispensary up here in Burlington. I'm also uh, the director of the Vermont Cannabis Trades Association, which is the coalition of the medical marijuana dispensaries here in Vermont. Uh, I did submit testimony, so there is written testimony. You may have it in front of you, uh, and I'll just kind of walk through uh, what we've outlined. Um, over 20% of our registered patients utilize some form of a pro excuse me, some form of a product for their symptom relief. Uh, our cartridges include either cannabis derived or botanically sourced terpenes as the active ingredients uh, and flavor components. So we try to keep our products uh, all natural when it comes to vape or e-liquid formulas. Uh, a consistent percentage of our patients are, are cannabis naive. It's their first time actually probably utilizing cannabis uh, and they might have a really strong reaction to the flavor. Uh, and so uh, being able to you know, provide a flavor to the cannabis, the normal kind of cannabis product without a flavor is very harsh. And so the flavor does benefit them uh, when they wanna utilize inhalation, uh, especially inhalation of cannabis versus uh, smoking dried flour. The vape product is a good alternative. Uh, you know, basically we use mild flavorings uh, that also mask the aroma of, of cannabis. Uh, that's also a concern for a patient when it comes to privacy when uh, utilizing cannabis for symptom relief. 
Uh, I'd also point out that other me medications out there do use uh, flavorings for medications. So it's not unusual for uh, people to have medications that have been flavored. Uh, and lastly, uh, I think that one of the larger points are with the recent uh, illicit vaping tests, the best way to ensure patient safety here in Vermont is by allowing the medical program to offer devices and liquid formulations, which have been tested, thereby displacing the counterfeit cartridges out there and the demand on the illicit uh, cannabis market. Uh, we wholeheartedly support the intent of S24, but we'd like to ensure S24 will not ban the e-liquids that patients use for their medications. Um, because medical uh, marijuana has not been approved by the FDA, it would be included in the definition of other substances slash tobacco substitute. The term tobacco substitute appears throughout S24. Uh, we'd like to propose an amendment to the definition of a tobacco substance to uh, exclude medical marijuana from being considered other substances. Uh, our amendment is the addition of the last sentence in bold and uh, underlined in the testimony that I've submitted. Uh, and I'll just read that very quickly. Uh, other substances used in this section shall not include substances sold by a dispensary registered under 18 BSA chapter uh, 86 or 7 BSA chapter 35 to registered patients and registered caregivers as those terms are defined in those chapters. Um, and that kind of concludes my testimony. I'd be happy to take questions uh, regarding, uh, you know, the use of vape pens in the medical marijuana program. Uh, Shane, thank you. And I, I know uh, you've been working with uh, patients uh, and helping treat them with utilizing medical marijuana. The, the initial bill for that went through this committee and uh, I was part of that discussion. Uh, yep. So, um, Thanks for your testimony. Senator Hardy has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, um, Mr. Lynn, Shane, <laughs> whatever. Um, <laughs> um, I'm wondering, uh, so I'm looking at the language on uh, at home here. And is this specific to medical marijuana? So you're you're just wanting this smaller carve out, not a broader carve out for all cannabis vaping products. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, yes, just for the medical program as is right now. Um, you know, and as I highlighted, um, you know, we have a, a twenty to twenty five percent, almost a quarter of our patients are utilizing vape products right now. So, and some of those are lightly flavored, is what your testimony and. Yeah, exactly. So what we do uh, with the extraction process is where we, you know, we grow the plants and then we extract the terpenes from the plants. So we're literally taking the aroma, the flavor off of the plant. We then add that back into the vape product as the flavoring. So we're not uh, using artificial flavors there. So we're trying to stay uh, natural in our approach uh, to, to the vape products. Without that flavoring, the oil from the plant is really harsh, uh, you know, and most people probably would not enjoy uh, inhaling it. So uh, this is a, a means to back to that, you know, mild flavor to it to um, uh, not create any resistance to using the product. Okay. But again, it's just an, the narrow not the broader. Okay, yep. that was what I wanted to get yep. clarity on. Thank you. Other questions, Senator Cummings. You're muted, Senator. Good. Um, would this bill ban cannabis vaping? It wouldn't. Uh, not, not medical marijuana, but is marijuana considered a tobacco product? No, it's not, um, you know, and still, you know, uh, still cannabis is not recognized by the FDA still. So, you know, there's a lot of gray area here. It's still federally legal, uh, you know, so. Uh, state there, okay, yeah. But so our youth could vape cannabis, but not tobacco. Is that, I'm not, I, 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 I'm just throwing that out as an open question if we do this. So uh, what do we need, I think, to get answered? Oh, Jen just popped up. Well, well I was just going to say, we'll trouble. ask Jen. And there are some guys. It's prescient. Um, <clears throat> Jennifer Carby, Legislative Council. So I don't think anything about what um, Mr. Lynn is, is proposing affects 
the separate um, cannabis statutes that I think have the same 20, age 21 restriction. I do think we have to look um, a little bit more carefully at how to frame the language if you wanted to pursue this kind of exception because it would take um, these products when, when used by or sold to uh, a registered patient from a registered dispensary out of the definition of tobacco substitute across our statutes, including things like the ban on using them on school grounds, ban on using them in cars with children. So I think we would have to, to look at narrowing it a bit so that the application is clear. Um, but as and, to the broader and, question about use, use by youth, it doesn't change the underlying cannabis statutes. Um, I'm, I'm trying to remember, but I think that when we passed um, one of our bills, we banned uh, uh, marijuana, vape, flavored vape marijuana products. So we have to check that. Yeah. All right. Any other questions for Shane? Senator Hooker. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Shane. Just to, I'm curious to know how many flavors you have. Like when we're talking about flavored tobaccos, there are hundreds and hundreds of them. Uh, I think we probably have three to four different flavors right now. So uh, it, it's, it's limited. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you uh, for your you. and for the language. I think uh, it's important. Thank, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks to everybody for the time uh, speaking, and I'm available for follow up and uh, if there are additional questions. So have a good day. Thank you. You too. Take care. Okay. Um, we have. Uh, we have some folks with us. Uh, we did hear from Maria Davies previously, but in a very crunched uh, piece of time. And so Maria, I'd like to welcome you back um, and understand that just a few minutes of testimony to upgrade or for, to remind us of your concerns from the last time you were here as a parent. And then because we do wanna hear again from Zoe Pickle, uh, a short bit, and then we have Moses for the first time. So we wanna leave sufficient time for Moses. I'd like to leave at least uh, 12 or 15 minutes for Moses. So we'll um, take uh, five to seven minutes from Maria and Zoe. So thank you. And we do have your testimony online. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, everyone. I'm not gonna read my testimony. You have it in okay. front of me. I've just been really actively listening and thank you for letting me be in this space. I'm Maria Davies. I'm a Stowe parent, and I am the parent of two kids, middle schooler and high schooler. And I'll give you briefly my story and my rude introduction into vaping, because I wasn't privy to a lot of the vaping devices that were out there until my kids alerted me to this. Kids were on the school bus. They smelled the vape. They saw the vape. Kids were vaping on the school bus. School bus contains middle schoolers, high schoolers, kindergartners. And so they're all mixed in. And my daughter alerted me to it. My son says he's seen it before. He didn't think it was a big deal. He's been offered vaping devices several times. He's always declined it. My daughter, who's a middle schooler, has also been offered vaping devices. So this alerted me and concerned me. I went to the principals and I said, do you see this? Are you seeing what's happening? And they said, yes, we do. And they said, we're confiscating it, Mrs. Davies, don't worry. And then I thought, well, what are you doing with the devices? <laughs> You're not putting them in the landfill, are you? Because I know they're not supposed to be in the landfill. But anyway, that's another story. And so they're confiscating it. They weren't penalizing the kids. They were just taking them away. But these kids were getting gift cards for their birthdays, for Christmas, for anything and buying these devices online. So it just started getting really crazy. And I just thought, I wonder if parents are aware of this. So I started talking to a lot of different parents. Parents would come to me because of my connections with Health of the Moral Valley. I'm a steering committee member there because I decided to start getting educated on these devices and what it meant and what was happening. So I can then educate my kids and my friends and my, my kids' friends on what was happening. And together we form a parent group, you know, to, to talk about this. 
to bring in a presenter in to say, these are the vaping devices. This is how it started. And this is what they look like now. Parents were just taken back. The kids knew exactly what they looked like, how many flavors there were, what it, you know, how you charge the thing on your computer and they could easily be concealed. So we showed them all this. And I, I couldn't believe how much parents didn't know and how much the kids knew. So then we brought another presenter in, another parent series to talk about what this does to their brain. And it's a long story, but we really try to educate both parents and the youth on what it is that they're doing so they can make healthier choices. For me, that was critical because I wanted the kids to know that they have options, that they don't have to do this, but they're constantly being targeted by these tobacco companies. They put these vaping devices near areas where kids go. They flock to, you know, to get a cookie or a sweet or something, and there they are right there. And so that angers me because there isn't any real, you know, rain in on this. The marketing is just crazy. And so these kids, yes, they'll go out of their way to get these devices, but it doesn't mean that we have to stop curbing this marketing and curbing the, the use of these devices. You know, so we need help. This bill will help us. And I hear, you know, um, testimony from the other people saying their revenue, their revenue is gonna go down. It's linked to crime, it's linked to this, but the, it's, it's at a cost of our kids' health. These kids are really getting hooked and they're getting incredibly you know, sick with these devices and, and nobody's caring about it. And our parents are not being educated. So I say, let's put some money in education to better educate the parents. COVID has exacerbated this issue because kids are in isolation. So I'm asking you with this bill to please help me you know, pass it because it's important to me, it's important to the parents that I speak to on a daily basis and the kids that come and saying, I, I need to quit. We're telling the principals, I need to quit. And I don't know how to, I need it, I need a fix. They need to get out of the classroom to get a fix. This is crazy. And so we need help. We need some type of help when it comes to this. And I don't care about their bottom line, the tobacco company's bottom line. I care about my kids' health. And those kids are getting hooked who are going to different counselors trying to figure out how to get themselves unhooked. So, I'm here to ask you to please pass this bill because I, I'm not interested in their bottom line. I'm interested in my kids' health. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, uh, I've, we've got a couple of questions. Um, I'm gonna ask a question and then I'm gonna tur turn right to Senator Cummings before you answer it. And uh, maybe you can add it into uh, an answer at some point. My, my question is simply that, do you belie believe that the educational programs that you've offered to kids and parents, have those educational programs in your mind been effective at deterring uh, the use of these products? And I'll just scoot right over to Senator Cummings with her question. No, I, I wanted to ask, we ban the sale uh, both in stores and online. The revenue sales aren't coming from youth. We banned the sale two years ago. So where are your kids getting these things so the kids are actually very savvy <laughs> they're getting them from older kids maybe their siblings um, from older adults i live in stowe it's very well known for a very party town and unfortunately people here turn a blind eye to that type of thing and they will offer a kid a vape I don't know why, I don't know, you know what the reasoning behind it is. And so they'll also buy them vapes for their birthday. Unfortunately, I don't think parents are very aware as to what they're actually giving their kids, which is why to, you know, to your other question, Ginny, is that I, I think education is key. These parents were able to understand it was pre-COVID. So we actually met at the cafeteria at school and put out a lunch and everything and explain to the kids and the parents what this means. The parents couldn't believe that that, that was out there. And the more we did these parent series, the more parents came and got more educated and asked more questions and asked for more series or more you know, um, uh, ideas on different types of series like mental health and um, brain development and things like that. So I think that it, it took off really well pre-COVID now that we're in COVID, we haven't been able to meet 
I still get parents on the quiet path and still asking me, hey, when are we doing these again? So I'm putting a, a Zoom parent cafe together for these parents so they can tell me what they're seeing and what they're hearing. So I think education is helping. Okay, so it rather than extending bands to adults, we might do better with working on cessation for the kids that are hooked and educating because not if, if adults are buying these things for kids, this isn't gonna stop that. Well, no, because we're banning it for adults too. Right. All right. And I think that I, 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 but I want I I really think that we should have to move on. I, I apologize again, but I think your points are extremely well taken and the work that you're doing in Stowe sounds amazing. Don't stop. <laughs> Please don't stop uh, with that. And we appreciate your comments on the bill as well. Um, Zoe, uh, we're going to turn to you. Um, and I'm uh, going to ask you if you would mind if we put Moses uh, a step ahead of you. No, go right ahead. That's totally All fine. Right. Moses, why don't you introduce yourself for the okay. record? Great. Thank you so much, Zoe. Thank you for making that little adjustment. I appreciate it. Um, my name is Moses Cheyenne Delane. Um, I am a student who graduated from Bells Free Academy Fairfax in 2017. And uh, in the years since then, I've found myself being pulled into a lot of these discussions and being a youth voice for um, things like drug prevention, substance use, and uh, just wellness practices at the middle school level, the high school level, and the college level. Um, one of the things I've been able to be involved in since graduating was I was the, uh, the youth, uh, a youth co-coordinator for a um, summer leadership, uh, youth leadership and prevention program called Franklin County Teen Institute, where we have um, high school representatives that are sent from all five counties in Franklin County. So just as a refresher, that's Bells Free Academy Fairfax, that's Bells Free Academy St. Albans. That's Missisquoi Valley Union, that's Richford and Enosburg High Schools. Um, and since then we've expanded to some um, kind of external ambassador positions. So we're having people from Burn Burton, we're having people from, this is, it, we're growing our community. And through my role in that, I'm able to interact with a lot of high school students from a lot of different environments from Vermont and teachers. Um, a year and a half ago, uh, I was in DC uh, for it's uh, the Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America convention um, in Washington, another big youth leadership forum. And um, one of our youth um, who was attending uh, from Missisquoi Valley Union shared this very powerful and empathetic story about, um, it's a student in math class, she's working and she sees her friend who's going through nicotine withdrawals because they need to go to the bathroom. And the, the point, being that their addiction, uh, the influence that tobacco is playing on their lives is now taken away from their educational experience. And that's, that's physical growth. Um, today, I'm here to just, I'm, I want to be able to really paint the picture for what young people are thinking about. This isn't, I'm not, I don't necessarily have a, a well, I, I do have a pretty strong opinion about this, but um, I want to be able to present this view to you guys so you guys can make the informed decision rather than making this be something that I'm trying to do myself. Um, so uh, with the, I, I like the Tobacco 21 rule. I've, I've done some projects on that in the last year or so uh, through UVM. Um, being able to raise that uh, smoking age from 18 to 21 did do a lot um, to term, uh, to limit access. But uh, in terms of allure for uh, kids and young people, the flavor is always gonna be something that's incentivizing and who it tastes good. And um, I have friends who I'm living with right now who um, are college age students. And you know, I, see, I, I saw them in June being like, all right, this is gonna be the last, this is gonna be our last e-cigarette, blah, blah, blah. And then like two weeks later, we got another one. It's now, so this is June, 2020, 2020, 2021, there, there, I'm, I'm telling you this. They're still at it, um, and so and I'm I'm seeing people uh, continue to be hooked. Um, I I do think Tobacco Twenty One did do a lot in terms of limiting access because, um, like Maria had said, I've also heard the in, in Enosburg. I, I went to Bell's Free Academy Fairfax. My school bus 
had we had kindergartners on it we had and middle schoolers on it we had we had everybody you know i graduated with 75 students in my class we're a small condensed community and everybody sees everybody um at the time we were seeing the 18 year olds who were at the time able to able to go buy these products and then flip them on the buses so they're thinking about i just need to make some money um and they're not thinking about oh i'm selling a potentially hazardous tobacco product to you know middle schoolers, adolescents. Um, and I think a lot about like through Teen Institute, I've learned that the brain is still developing until 27, 28, and it's even higher for men. Um, but, uh, you know, so I think if, if someone wanted to make the sacrifice at 21, there's, there's still so much that we don't know about how these um, substances are going to affect a developing mind. And there's the flavors are targeting kids. They are. Um, I, I don't want to equate this too much to dab, car dab cartridges or concentrated um, cannabis things, but you, you see the same marketing there. Um, I'm seeing um, cannabis cartridges um, with like it's it's cartoons from Nickelodeon that I remember growing up. And um, it's like Cosmo Wanda on the side of the packaging. They're bright. It's the Skittles flavor. It's the and but I know other people have made this argument for me and I only have a certain amount of time. So I'm trying to keep moving. Um, You're OK. I think in the short term, college people my age, I think about, so I attend UVM. Um, UVM is not just for Montreux students. We have a lot of students who, majority of students who are coming from out of state um, and are using flavored tobacco things because that's something that their normal state has normalized. So if you tell a 20 year old UVM student that Vermont is going to ban um, flavored e-cigarettes, they're going to be bummed in the short term. But I also understand that we have to look at this in a larger perspective. There's um, the, uh, with, uh, with menthol, the idea of, um, we're seeing all these racial injustices in terms of marketing um, and being able to use this opportunity to take menthol off the table can be an extension of a larger effort that we're seeing in terms of equity because you know i've i, I watched a documentary last night called um black lives black lungs about um the different ways like we're having 80 percent of black smokers who are specifically um using menthol cigarettes and how that percentage of um black smokers using specifically menthol products has risen over the years it, it used to be equal with um it with um, white white smokers were using menthol at a at the same rate as black, and then five years passed, and the uh, percentage of black smokers that were using menthol tripled, and then a couple of years passed again, it tripled again, and now we're seeing that I I had previously thought that it was eighty percent of black smokers um, were smoking menthol cigarettes, but we heard Mr. Levine earlier say that it's now above ninety percent. Um, tobacco is the leading killer in black deaths or the, the leading cause of black deaths in America right now with, I think it's 45,000 to 49,000 um, a year uh, people are, are dying of this. And that is a, uh, I can make the assumption that that's a direct correlation to the explicit targeting that we're seeing. The, uh, I know that you guys are more familiar with the data than I am, but um, in terms of targeting these people and I, okay, so I'm saying a lot, um, but if I'm, if I'm painting my my personal opinion, um, I want to remember that story of the MVU student who is going through withdrawals. Um, I, the Tobacco 21 law is going to make an effect um, in terms of accessibility, um, but there's still more to do. And in terms of if we're thinking on behalf of the entirety of the state, this is another thing that we can do to reduce that percentage of um, the possibility of uh, young youth being initiated into these kind of products. Um, removing all flavors um, will uh, only further deter the efforts of big tobacco trying to uh, attempt to marketing pro products to children. Uh, and again, remembering that we're having brains that are still developing. Um, the information that CADCA is sharing is, is still new because I, I, could, I can tell you honestly, I'm 21, I'd never seen a jewel before 2018. Um, the, the whole process of an e-cartridge cigarette thing, we're still learning so much about, and I like to err on the side of caution. Um, and in terms of a, uh, the financial argument, uh, I believe that this, this shouldn't be a money conversation. This should be a public health conversation. This should be an equity conversation. This should be a racial justice conversation. This should be a humanity conversation, but, um, 
in terms of being able to make money, um, you know, the market's going to do what it does and evolve like things do. People forget about products as time passes. And, um, you know, we think a lot about um, people being dependent on the, the product that they're first initiated with. So for my generation or for the, the generation before me, it was the combustible cigarettes. And there's the people who are still going to smoke the combustible cigarettes as we go. Um, but for me, you know, this this window of e-cigarettes being a thing has only been like three, four years. And I like the idea of being able to catch it earlier. Um, the fact that Massachusetts has already passed legislation um, uh, pertaining to this kind of stuff is again another green light for me in terms of we should be trying to match this effort um, because um, it, it gives us the opportunity to kind of leverage our reputation as a state to uh, role model this kind of equity empathy to other states the people around us uh, and to our federal government in time so even though we might not be on pace or we might, we might not be matching the other states around us by making this statement we are influencing they could be having this conversation six months from now and looking to, for us for reference. Um, I'm, I've said a lot and I've rambled a lot, but I'd like you, to thank you, you for your time. You, you've, covered, yes. you've covered a huge amount of ground, Moses, and uh, yes. thank you for that. Um, Senator Cummings has a question. Senator Hardy Please. has a question. And then we're going to move on to, to Zoe. And uh, thank you for being here and for the good work that you're doing. Absolutely. I'm, I'm happy okay. to be of service. We've been told that we need to do this for racial equity because black people are more likely to smoke menthols than other people. My question is why? I'm a woman. Women have been targeted. I'm an antique dealer. I, I can show you old Chesterfield ads where women are specifically targeted. There's Virginia Slims and you've come a long mm -hmm. way, baby. But I haven't heard that women are more likely to smoke or use menthol, except we do have a much higher percentage of pregnant women that smoke. But what I'm trying to figure out, is this totally <laughs> advertising or does it have something to do with life experience or stress mm. or, you know, what is the best way to, to get at the issue? Yeah, I think there's, I think there's definitely a lot of moving pieces in terms of this kind of, or like what could go into the effects of um, why are black people using more menthol? Um, I think about historically, what the tobacco industry used to be. Let's, I, and I, again, I don't know all the facts around this because I'm, I'm 21. I grew up in Kentucky. I probably okay, inhaled sure. enough tobacco. Yes. You know, um, listen, I, listen, I, I, I do not want to interrupt this conversation. I think the question that you've asked Senator Cummings is a question that perhaps um, we should review Dr. Gardner's uh, testimony because it was so very much targeted toward marketing and the, the marketing piece has become extremely key. Uh, I am very sensitive to our time right now. I think mm. hold your question. And that is something that perhaps you might want to reach out to um, Dr. Levine about or uh, folks in the health department. Yeah, I, I, would, I would also add uh, very quickly that, um, um, and, and a lot of this is information I've kind of inhaled over the last few days, but, um, you're you're seeing tobacco um tobacco lobbyists um they're funding things like scholarships for the NAACP and they're kind of like uh, they're being able to kind of leverage the fact that they have this money that they can use to help um in the short term people who don't have that kind of level of money and it, it kind of gives them a bargaining chip on the table like with um we saw the FDA um when uh, Obama passed the legislation that um uh made it illegal to add additive additives into tobacco other than menthol menthol was left on the table because of tobacco lobbyists able to kind of influence that um but that again that is not a wheelhouse i am super confident in and i'm sure that for time efficiency someone else can give you better than it's well, but <laughs> you're, you're right on target with the fda piece um that is that has been documented uh senator hardy Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Moses, for your testimony and all the work that you've been doing over the last few years Pleasure. in this area. Um, it's very impressive. Um, 
I just want to ask for you to clarify and maybe underscore a point that I heard you make. And, um, and, and this is a sort of what you've heard us ask various questions about this because two years ago, which was actually my first year in the Senate, we passed tobacco 21, which, you know, eliminated the sale of tobacco products all across the board for anybody under the age of 21. So what I'm, what I heard from you, I think was that you think that has been effective that it has reduced the prevalence and use of tobacco among people under 21, but that because flavors are so alluring and you know bringing people into the potential of using tobacco products, it hasn't been enough. Is is that what you? I would testified? yes. I would okay. I would say um, my. Uh, in the college setting, the tobacco 21 rule, the, the, the idea of social source, um, social, social source awareness or social, social source, um, yeah, social so source awareness. When you're in a high school setting, there's a lot less high schoolers that know 21 year olds than if you're in a college setting, uh, like 18 year olds are going to know 21 year olds. So college people have to sacrifice a little bit less because it's easier for them to, if they wanted to bypass the whole, there's 21 things, they, they can do that. Um, and we're still getting the, the prevention efforts we want with middle schoolers and with high schoolers. Um, uh, yes, there's another uh, important piece about um, people coming from out of state and bringing these products into state. Um, but I, again, I think that that's a, a good discussion for you guys to have rather than myself. And uh, I think I that is a good place to um, move on. Uh, thank you very much, Moses. It's great to have you. Yes, and um, I'm happy to make myself available in the future. Um, we danced a little bit about, um, you know, what um, concentrated um, cannabis things. I, I am also well-versed in, in that. Um, I think there's some important legislation we should make about hemp and CBD production. Okay, uh, well, him. we're not going there today. I'm, I'm done. Thank you for your time, <laughs> okay. and I wish you luck in an informed you decision. Know, thank you. I, yes. I want to give Zoe uh, some time, and we'll probably go past the 11 o'clock hour for this, but Zoe, uh, just within a few minutes, if you don't mind, um, You've heard a lot of the testimony, but you've also uh, been involved, I think, locally on some of the work. So why don't you introduce yourself for the record and then give us your testimony? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Zoe Pakel. I'm a youth advocate, and I'm also a national youth ambassador for Vermont with the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. Um, so for many years, the tobacco industry has been focusing on youth with its products to ensure it has long-time addicted customers, and things haven't changed with e-cigarettes, so it's still the same tactics. Industry documents and actions highlight their desire to get youth hooked. When Terrence Sullivan, an R.J. Reynolds sales representative, asked the company which young people they were targeting, this was his response. They got lips, we want them. And from the Lorillard Tobacco Company, the base of our business is the high school students. And I got these quotes from the 84 Movement, their website. Um, and in my first two years of high school, I've just seen some of the impact of flavors and vaping. I remember sitting in class and hearing countless conversations about vapes, discussions over which flavors are the best, if the classmate was willing to sell any jewel pods and which device delivered the best head rush. And one thing that sticks out to me the most is hearing a classmate say, I can't get out of bed until I take a hit. I just can't get going without it. And a hit refers to the act of using the vape. And it's concerning that the amount of students in Vermont who report vaping daily has doubled. This is addiction. And so these products have become a part of the youth culture, flavors and all. And by passing this legislation, you have the ability to remove these products from youth culture before they become too ingrained to remove. The amount of nicotine in one jewel pod is equivalent to a pack of cigarettes. So these products are very addictive and they're very hard to stop, especially with flavors. Whether or not to start using tobacco products is certainly a choice that many face, especially when they're young and peer pressure and the need to fit in is high. But eliminating the sale of fl flavor, sorry, flavor tobacco products lessens the pressure to start and a whole lot less youth will choose tobacco when it doesn't have the cool factor provided by flavors and menthol that are just begging kids to try them. Right now there are over 15,000 tobacco flavors on the market and every single one of those flavors makes it easier to use the tobacco product, pr sorry, products because it masks the flavors of tobacco and all the other chemicals found in the devices. I encourage you to make sure you get rid of all flavored tobacco products and don't just take the incremental step and not address menthol. 
getting rid of some flavors will only will not stop the current vapors and tobacco users from using tobacco, nor will it prevent new youth from using tobacco in the first place. Uh, it's like when your favorite true crime show is no longer airing, you can't watch it anymore. It's you're not going to stop watching true crime shows. You're just going to move on to the next one because it has the same idea behind it. It's still a true crime show. It's the same exact thing with flavors. If you take away some flavors, the kids are still going to want the flavors. They still like the flavors. They're just going to move on to the next flavor because it's still a flavor. It's still making it easier for them to use the tobacco products. We need to protect youth from the tobacco industry because it's been aggressive in focusing on them. And by them, I mean youth. Uh, Jules purchased ads on youth-focused websites such as Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon, Seventeen Magazine. They also rejected an ad proposal that would have laid a clear foundation for an adult-centered marketing campaign. And their marketing techniques relate Jewel to identity, self-image, sex appeal, and romance. And it's not even just Jewel. Um, most e-cigarette companies have used scholarships, not most, but some e-cigarette companies have used scholarships, sponsored events, appealing flavors, and social media to promote products to, the, to youth. And they've counted on kids to help market their products as well, and it's worked. There's been user-generated content that includes memes of kids' movie characters holding vapes and other memes about Juul and other vapor products have circled social media. Sorry, I forgot to share my screen when I first started. Um, so these are some ad, um, user generated content and ads if you don't mind turning your attention to the screen. Um, up here in the top row in the middle, you have Elmo telling kids that in order to be cool, they need to vape. And you also have some of the memes that I was just describing with Buzz Lightyear saying when you're buzzing hard, holding a vape and also Patrick um, describing how sophomores look their jewel when it's almost out of juice, which refers to the, the e-liquid e in it. And then down here on the bottom, in the bottom left, there are um, e-cigarette ads that can be seen as youth marketing on the entire bottom row. But on the bottom left is a um, advertisement directly from Jewel, featuring a young woman holding her vape, looking very appealing to youth. In the bottom middle is um, the ad proposal that I just briefly touched on that was rejected. And then here on the bottom right, you have an ad from Puff Bar, with, which is a disposable cigarette that comes in many different flavors. And um, the ad, I'll go over it quickly. Um, so they are saying that stay sane with Puff Bar this solo break. They know that you'll love it because it's the perfect escape from back-to-back -back Zoom calls, parental text, and WFH stress, which is working from home stress. And so who would you say that is geared toward? geared towards. For me, I would say that it's directly geared towards youth because they are the ones doing back-to-back -back Zoom calls for school and other projects. They're getting parental texts and they might not necessarily have working from home stress depending on their job. Because so I know I'm working from home right now, but not everybody has the same occupation I do. Um, so that is, it could be seen as geared towards adult, but that's less than half of the ad. Um, so this bill can protect the future and present generations from these addictive products. As I said before, to effectively lessen the number of youth who choose to use the products, all flavors need to go. If any flavors are still on the market, that's going to be what you'll find youth using. And we don't have to look too far back for an example. In 2018, when Juul removed fruity flavors from stores following public pressure, but left mint and menthol remaining, menthol sales jumped from 51% to 64%. And so given all these photos, I understand why Juul and other vape companies have been so successful in getting youth to make the choice to vape. Youth are exposed to toxic, addictive, cancer-causing devices, and they have the choice in front of them to use them or not. And these flavors definitely make it a whole lot easier for them to use them. As a youth who resents the targeting of my generation by the industry, an advocate who cares about the health of my peers, and a sister who wants to protect her younger brothers, I firmly believe that the only way to end the youth vaping epidemic is by ending what is enticing youth to start, the availability of flavored tobacco products in all forms. In weighing your decision, I would encourage you to ask yourself what the reasons would be for keeping flavors on the market, whether it be revenue or anything of the sort, and then consider how that outweighs to the future of our youth. And as a youth, I would say that we deserve more than a lifetime of addiction. Zoe, thank you. That was very clear and comprehensive. Um, a lot of information. Uh, 
one quick question for Zoe. Does anyone have a, a question at this point? Zoe, thank you. And um, I know that we'll stay connected and we appreciate the time that you've um, given to us both today and uh, last week. I think it was last week, although time flies. All right, thank you. Um, all right, committee. Um, this has been this has been a long haul on this one topic, and I, we're moving into the next topic of audio only. And we have folks here um, representing different uh, interests. What I'm going to suggest, and, and I mean seriously, two minutes of a quick break, and then we'll come back and we'll begin to address. Um, we'll begin to address. And thank you, Moses. Uh, the um, audio only, the flexibility bill. So Nellie, you can put this.